Hello and welcome to Jack Myers Ministries and Life Family Church Podcast. Be blessed by this week's message. Open your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of John, chapter 19. This morning I want to talk to you about, it is finished. It is finished. Now, we're living in some pretty interesting times, and there's some interesting things coming. I guess, what is it, April the 8th? We have a solar eclipse or something like that that's coming, right? And then, I mean, according to most of the prophets on YouTube, it's at the end of the world. Praise God, amen. I mean, if you kind of look at that, it's all the end of the world. No, these are signs of the times. You know, Jesus talked about it, you know, that the sun, sun would be turned dark and the moon into blood before the great and noble day of the Lord, right? But you don't need to be concerned about all these things. There's wars and rumors of wars. I mean, we're actually, we're, we're probably in a war right now in the United States. You just don't know about it. I mean, all kinds of things are just happening all everywhere, you know, and people's hearts are growing cold. You can see that, right? I mean, just drive on I-4, you can see how cold people's hearts are. I mean, it's just amazing what's happening. And I want to encourage everyone in this room to press into God because Jesus is coming soon. He's coming sooner than anybody thinks. And so in the meantime, we occupy, we do the work of the Lord. We win as many souls to Jesus as possible. Come on now. And then we'll stand before the great and notable day of the Lord, and he'll say to you, well done, thy good and faithful servant. So we must do the work while it's still a day, for night cometh where no one can work, right? In the book of John, chapter 19, starting verse 16, it says this, Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them, so the soldiers seized him and took him away to be crucified. Jesus carried his own cross out of the city to, place, to the place called the Skull, which is in the Aramaic Golgotha. And there they nailed him to a cross. He was crucified along with two others, one on one side and one on the other side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had them post a sign over the cross, which was written in three languages, Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Many of the people of Jerusalem read the sign, for he was crucified near the city. The sign stated, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Verse 21, but the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, you must change the sign. Don't let it say king of the Jews, but rather claim, he claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate responded, what I've written, it'll remain. Now, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they divided up his clothes into four shares, one of each of them. But the tunic was seamless, woven from top to bottom as a single garment. So the soldiers said to each other, don't tear it. Let's throw dice to see who gets it. The soldiers did all of this, not knowing they were fulfilling the scriptures, saying they divided my garments among them and gambled for my garment. Mary, Jesus' mother, was standing next to the cross, along with Mary's sister, Mary the wife of Clopius, and Mary Magdalene. So then Jesus looked down and saw the disciple he loved standing with her. And he said, Mother, look, John will be your son to you. And then he said to John, look, she will be your mother to you. And from that day forward, John accepted Mary into his home as one of the family. In verse 28, Jesus knew that his mission was accomplished. You'll know when your mission is accomplished. You'll know when you've run your race, you've finished your course. Because you can run your race and you can finish your course. Your life doesn't have to be shortened. Jesus willingly laid down his life for us, did he not? Then there's a time and place when you can lay down your life as well. But now is not the time. Verse 29, a jar of sour wine was sitting nearby and they soaked it with a sponge and put it on a stalk of hyssop and raised it to his lips. And when he had sipped the sour wine, he said, it is finished, my bride. Then he bowed his head and he surrendered to the spirit. See, Jesus' words, it is finished, seem strange. After all, he was dying on the cross. What had he finished? What his audience didn't know was the death on the cross was accomplishing something that was very life-changing. Number one, what was the purpose of Jesus coming? Out of all the religions in the world, all of their leaders never died on a cross and never died for their followers. Only Jesus died for his followers. Jesus died for all humanity to have an opportunity to be restored back to that which Adam and Eve had lost. The purpose of Jesus coming, number one, to give us eternal life to all those that choose life. See, God created the human race with two free gifts. One, the gift of life, and two, the gift of a free will. You're going to live forever. You were not only created in the image of God, but you also were created with a free will. You'll live forever. Now, we've been promised 120 years in this life, but the average life is probably about 70, 80, maybe 90 years. 
What does that compare to eternity to eternity? And you have to remember that what you do in this life will count for the life to come. Are we living it for ourselves or are we living it for others? Are we following the way or are we following our way? See, free will has been given to all humanity. Whether people use their free will wisely or not, some do and some don't. Free will. What kind of God creates a creation and gives them the gift of life and then gives them a gift of a free will to choose? To choose life or to choose death? To choose to worship God, to choose to reject God? To choose that they believe there is a God or to choose they believe there's not a God. That's pretty incredible. Not only that, he created the human race in his image. You want to know why he hates you so much, Satan hates you so much? Because every time he sees you, he sees God because you were created in his image. Each and every one of you were created for destiny. You have a purpose. We're not just created here to breathe everybody's air and eat everybody's food. We weren't created here to become who's the most wealthiest, who obtains the most, all the toys. King Solomon at the end of his life, he said, it's all worth nothing. He gained everything. I mean, he had silver and gold dumps in his backyard. He walked on golden tiles in his house. I mean, he had 700 wives. Oh, my God, help us. (laughs) I'm just making it with one, praise God, amen, let alone 699. I have to walk into understanding with my wife after 38 years of being with her. She has trained me well, whether I realize it or not. Praise God. Amen. Now, you have to understand the purpose of Jesus is coming. He came to save and to seek that which was lost, and that was humanity. You see, Satan tricked Adam and Eve in the garden because God created Adam and Eve, and it is Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve. Adam, man, Eve, whoa, man. Praise God. Amen. So how do you know he said, whoa, man? Because when Eve was presented to Adam, the first thing out of his mouth was, whoa, man. So it just kind of stuck for the last 6,000 years. And the married guy said, well, you need to say a little bit better amen than that. No, they were, Satan tricked them. And that same trickery serpent is the same today and it's been 6,000 years. That's the reason why we need not to be ignorant of the devil's devices. We have to understand not only the patterns that he uses against us, but we also need to understand the cycles that we fall in. What cycle are you in at this time in your life? If people really knew God and knew what Jesus did at the cross and everything that was accomplished, humanity would be running to him and they would use their free will wisely. Ah, with Dr. Jack, you know, people use Jesus as a crutch. Are you kidding me? I use him as a stretcher. I've discovered that Jesus does much better than me and he helps me become better. Does he not do the same for you? You see, he came to give eternal life to all those that were lost. And Matthew 18, 11 says this, the Son of Man has come to give to anyone who has lost eternal life. He came to destroy the works of the devil. And 1 John 3, 8 says this, but to the one who indulges in a sinful life is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the very beginning. The reason the Son of Man came and revealed himself unto us was to destroy the works of the devil. The goal of Jesus was to undo what Adam and Eve did in the garden by disobeying God and turning over the world and the spirit realm over to Satan. You see, Adam and Eve not only ruled this earth, but they also ruled and reigned in the spirit realm because they had glorified bodies. They had perfect bodies. And then when Satan came in, man lost that spirit realm and came totally into the natural realm and then lost the authority in which God had given Adam and Eve on the earth. It was disobedience. How many of you have children in here? Can I see your hand? You know, when they were growing up, I had two sons. I would tell them there's obedience and disobedience. Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings discipline. Isn't it interesting? 
the circumstances sometimes that we go through and the trials and tribulations that we go through is kind of a little bit of a discipline because God wants us to grow up spiritually. We go through things in the testing of our faith, not the tempting of evil, because God does not tempt with evil, but he tests your faith through the trials and tribulations to see what your response is going to be. We, we, we want to believe God for healing in our body, but we're not willing to learn the principles to have healing manifest. One of the things, if you need healing in your body, is you have to declare out of your mouth. You have to start speaking to your circumstances. you got to start speaking to your body. Come on, hello, somebody. Smith Wigglesworth, I mean, for five years, he had kidney stones. He would pass in kidney stones for five years. He also said that he would never have a surgeon cut on his body ever. But he said these out of his mouth. He didn't even have an autopsy when he gave up the ghost at 87 years old. But he would speak to his body. You have to speak to your circumstances. Smith Wigglesworth said, I don't, my body doesn't tell me what to do. I tell my body what to do. You have to start speaking to your, your body. you got to start saying out of your mouth. Do not accept that which the devil is trying to put on you. you life and death are in the power of your tongue. If you do not like what you're getting, you have to change what you've been saying. Because there's power in your words. As a matter of fact, scientists have the ability to literally pull out sound waves out of the atmosphere. Many years ago, they pulled a sound wave out of the atmosphere. They put it through a computer, digitally enhanced it, and it was a preacher preaching in Australia 30 years ago. So when you say things out of your mouth, if you say, well, I can't afford this, I can't afford that, I can't afford, well, guess what you've been getting? You can't afford it. Come on, hello, somebody. Talk to me now. Say amen or oh me or something. I mean, this is Resurrection Sunday. Come on, hello, somebody. Me. <laughs> Your words are very creative. They're creating the world you're living in right now. Do you realize that? If you don't, I hope you realize it now. But you are creating the world you're living in by the words of your mouth. If God said there's life and death in the power of your tongue, what are you saying? Satan's whole goal is to deceive you. That's his whole goal. He wants to kill, steal, and to destroy, and he does it through deception. The worst place of deception is being self-deceived. The only thing that removes self-deception is God's word because his word is entrance to light. That's the reason why you have to put his word in your heart. Psalms 107, 105 verse 19 says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. In John chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and the word came unto his own and his own received him not. Come on, hello somebody. The world didn't even recognize who its creator was when Jesus came into the world. But to all those that God revealed to them, he gave power to become the sons of God. Hebrews 4, 12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the dividing of soul and spirit and joints of marrow is the discerner of the heart. In, in, in the book of Psalms, it says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's, the entrance of wisdom is through his words because these words are alive. And you, that's the reason why you have to read your Bible. But you, when you tell people to read their Bible, they don't read their Bible. <laughs> I, don't, I guess maybe because people don't want to be told what to do. I guess it goes back to your great, 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 grandfather and grandmother, Adam and Eve. It goes back to that free will thing. But you have to understand you are creating your world with your words. Satan, what people say, well, does Satan know my future? He knows your future based on the patterns of the past. He is not all-knowing. And Satan is not omnipresent. And not only that, there's not a demon behind every tree. Here a demon, there a demon, everywhere a demon, demon, E-I-E-I-O. Come on now. Well, only one third of the angels went with Lucifer. We still have two thirds with us. Can you say amen? And we don't know the number, but we still have them. 
We have two thirds. We have the Holy Ghost. We have the Word of God. We have Jesus. God Almighty, uh, the creator of the entire universe, backs us up. For this reason, the Son of Man was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. Did he accomplish what he sent? He said, yes, because it is finished. Then why is there sickness and disease in the earth? Because when sin came into the earth, that's what causes sickness and disease. And poverty and lack. The last conquering element is death itself. We live and we die in the natural, but we live for eternity. So the fact is you never really die, you just transfer locations. You transfer locations. It's one life you're living. You are going to live forever. And I'm sorry, no, you don't get wings. And there are no fat babies with wings in heaven. Those aren't angels. When I go to heaven, will I be bored? You won't be bored. Because everywhere you turn, you'll be like, whoa, wow, wow. Whoa, that's cool. Wow, it's been 500 years and you haven't got past the wow part yet. <laughs> the goal of Jesus was to undo what Adam and Eve did in the garden by disobeying God and turning the world and the spirit realm over to Satan. In Luke 4, Luke 4, and 5, Luke 4 5 and 6 says this, And the devil, taking him up to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this power I will give thee and the glory of them, for it has been delivered unto me, and whomsoever I will give it, I will give it. Satan tricked Adam and Eve to give up the dominion on earth and the authority over the, every living thing. But Jesus came to restore back that power, that which was lost. That's the reason why he came as a sinless human being, died on the cross, shed his blood to provide that which was lost from Adam and Eve. Amen. When you understand this, you will understand that God is number one in your life because he created you. He thought of you before he put you in your mother's womb. That's powerful. And each and every one of you has a destiny to fulfill. We well, say, Dr. Jack, how's my destiny discovered? On the road of obedience. Yes. Okay, well, what do you mean? Well, you're putting God first. Like the, you have a relationship. I mean, I've been married 38 years. If, if all of a sudden I moved to a foreign country and hadn't talked to her for 10 to 15 to 20 years, probably, I mean, because of just the flesh, we'd fall out of love with each other and wouldn't even remember each other. It's the same thing with the relationship with God. If you never talk to him or spend time with him, he's not going to force you to do it. Come on, hello. He doesn't even force you to tithe or give of offerings. The governments of the world force you to. They take it out of your paycheck whether you want to or not. They didn't. Did they ask you this last Friday when you got paid? Oh, we just want to say, um, Mr. Matt, we just want to know, can we, can we take 15% out of your paycheck and all that kind of stuff? I mean, we're just, we're just, I mean, we are the U.S. government and, you know, those greenbacks, we created them, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, I'm just trying to, and, oh, by the way, and there's another 10% on top of that on the 15%. And, and ultimately, what we really want to do is take 50% of your check and give it to people that don't work as hard as you. How do you feel about that? And you may say, oh, man, the government, you say it one time, oh, man, the government took so much out of my, and then eventually you don't say anything at all. It's just like, okay, it is what it is. Isn't it interesting that God's not that way? His 10% hasn't changed for 6,000 years. He's not even going up. <laughs> he hasn't changed. What do you mean 6,000 years of tithe? Yeah, the principle of the tithe goes all the way back to the garden. Did you know that? If you don't know that, I'm, I'm fixing to tell you so that you'll know it. It goes all the way back to God. God said of every fruit, of every tree in the garden, you could partake of, but the fruit of this one tree, so you could have 90% of all the fruit, but the 10% fruit is my tree, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You shall not eat of it, and you shall not touch it. In the day, watch it, in the day you touch that 10% is the day that you'll die. That was way before Levitical law. 
That's an interesting principle, isn't it? You mean to tell me that 10%? Why? Because God has to have a seed from you to get a harvest to you because there's always seed, time, and harvest. Jesus came to provide a way back to God and he provides that through salvation. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's a great love scripture, but it's also a thou shalt not perish scripture. He also provided it through restoration. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18, it says this, now if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he's become an entirely new creation. All that is related to the older self has vanished away. Behold, everything is fresh and new. And God has made all things new and reconciled us to himself and given us a ministry of reconciliation to others. So he reconciliated himself through the blood of Jesus and what Jesus did at the cross. When, and when he rose from the grave and when he said it is finished, everything was accomplished. He, he made a way where there seemed to be no way. He also provided healing and prosperity. In 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. So when he said it is finished, your prosperity, in which Satan brings poverty, when sickness and disease comes, it is finished provides healing so that you can walk in divine health. You can walk in divine prosperity. You can reign and rule in this life, seated at the right hand with Christ, because Christ lives on the inside of you. You say, Dr. Jack, but my flesh, my flesh. How do, how do I crucify my flesh? Did he not say I have to crucify my flesh? Yeah. The Bible is very clear. Okay, I have sexual addiction. What does the Bible say? Run. <laughs> there you go. The one word, just run. Well, I got a drug problem. What do I say? Just say no. <laughs> run and no. It's pretty good. I'll just say that right now. It's not that, sorry, it's not that complicated. Run and no. I mean, even Nancy Reagan said it. Just say, no. He returned the joy of our salvation. You don't have to be depressed and oppressed. You're looking at the wrong things. You're looking at what you don't have instead of what God has. He's the owner of the world. He owns the universe. This is not Reebok's world. This is our world. We were created to reign and rule. It's all these other voices telling you, you can't, you can't, you can't. But the Bible says in Philippians 4, 19, I can do all things through Christ and strengthens me. You know, many years ago, I got into a major, major car accident. I actually have a titanium rod in this leg. We were in a van, and um, a young man ran a red light at 50 miles an hour, and I was sitting in the passenger side. And it crushed the whole lower part of the van and was in the hospital and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, it just really messed some things up in my body, you know? But I had a choice. I could just lay in bed and wither away, or I could start declaring out of my mouth, by Jesus' stripes, I am healed. There was one time I was on the crutches, and I slipped, and I fell right on the ground. And I had, a, I had an opportunity to do two things. Either cuss, More people got excited over here about that, praise God, than over here. Because this is the holy side over here. Right? Stretch forth your hand to the sinners, if you would, please. Okay. Pray it <laughs> no, I have an opportunity. Either I'm going to cuss or say, in the name of Jesus, by his stripes, I am healed. With tears running down my face because of the pain. And there were times I'd get mad at the circumstances because we lived in a two-story house and I had to walk up and down the crutches. And there was this one time I got really mad at the situation and I hadn't driven like in three weeks. I hadn't been driven the car in three weeks. You know, you got this cast on your foot and on his leg and they had just had surgery and everything. So I decided to go for a drive. <laughs> and I went for the drive, even though I was compelled by someone else not to do it. Because <laughs> I'm not going to just lay in bed and waste away. Somebody say amen. Yes. No, I'm going to get up. I'm going to go for a drive. And I went for a drive. And calmed down and turned around and came back and felt good about it. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> no, listen, you got to do, do sometimes what you don't feel like doing. You got to start speaking to your circumstances. You want your circumstances to change? Start. Don't accept them. 
Come on, no matter what the pressure is, no matter what Satan's trying to do, don't, well, your marriage, your marriage. No, 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 I have a great marriage. My marriage is good. My marriage is favorable. When, if one could put 1,000 to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight. Oh, my kids, my kids. No, my kids are going to serve the Lord. They're going to worship God. They're not going to serve the devil. They're going to serve my grandkids. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Jesus restored everything because of his blood and because of what he did at the cross. When he said it is finished, it is everything that you need. Everything is you need is in his blood because the blood is sufficient and everything that you need is in it is finished. Jesus restored our authority over the devil. And Matthew 10, 1 says this, And when he had called unto them the twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and disease. Why? Because there's authority in that name. See, there's life and forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. That's what it was provided for. I know it's hard to forgive people that hurt you or continually to hurt you. It's probably the continual part. But Jesus answered it. When they were doing it to him, you know what he said? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Can you say that when somebody's constantly doing something to you? I have to even remind myself when people do things to me. I forgive them. I forgive them, Lord. They didn't know what they're doing. Sometimes you're not the one that's deceived talking to a deceived individual. Because you see the light and all they see is the darkness. But they think that their darkness is the light. They think what they're doing is right. Because the Bible does say in the last days, people will do what they feel is right in their own eyes. Even, and even though you and I know otherwise, but they, that's self-deception. But can you say, I forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Can you say, Lord, bless them. Jesus said, bless those who curse you and despitefully use you. Oh my gosh, we're hitting it today. I'm telling you. <laughs> Can you bless somebody who despitefully uses you? Now, you don't have to keep falling into the same mess now. I mean, the Bible is very clear. If somebody wants to borrow your lawnmower, you give them your weed eater too. Praise God, amen. Oh, it's your cloak, the cloak, I'm sorry. If somebody, if somebody borrows your cloak, you, you, know, you give them your jacket too. If somebody says, well, you walk with me one mile, you walk two miles. Dr. Jack, how much abuse can I take? How much did Jesus take your abuse? Did he not take your abuse? Did Jesus not take your abuse? Did he take it upon him? He sure did. I can't forgive them. Do you need Jesus to forgive you? Yes. Then who are we not to forgive those that come against us when we need forgiveness from the Lord. Amen. And he's perfect, and you're dealing with an individual who's imperfect. Can't afford. Can't afford it. Just brings nothing but more pain and sorrow. You see, there's life and forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. And John 1, 6 through 9 says this, If we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not know the truth. But if we walk in the light, he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. He casts our sins into the sea, in the depths of the sea. In Micah 7, 19, it says this, and he will turn again and he will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou wilt cast all thy sins into the depths of the sea. In Psalms 103, verses two through five, it says this, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who forgiveth all thy sins and heals your broken body, who forgives us and cleanses us by his blood and heals our body because that's who he is, who redeems our life from destruction, who's crowned us with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies my mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. You see, there's life and forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. Thank God. Thank God, thank God, thank God. 
I mean, needless to say, did anybody mess up this week besides me? If you didn't mess up this week, I want to know your secret. Praise God. Amen. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Thank God for his blood and his mercy and his kindness. Even when we feel guilty. Anybody ever feel guilty and condemned? I feel guilty and condemned at times. Even though we've asked for forgiveness, isn't that just like the enemy to try to heap upon us condemnation? You have to understand the Holy Spirit brings conviction before we fall into the mess. And then if we fall into the mess because of our free will, then we condemnation comes. Because therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, watch this, who walk not after the flesh. That's the struggle in which the apostle Paul had. He had his recreated spirit man, which is brand new, because your spirit man can't sin, but your flesh nature can. And there's a war that goes on between your recreated spirit man, your new creature in Christ, and your flesh nature. That's where the war is. And at times we yield to our flesh. We surrender to our flesh. So what combats that? Putting the word of God in you, coming to church, serving the Lord. You're working your salvation with fear and trembling. You're progressively moving forward in the things of God. We're not retreating. We're not retreating. We're not falling back. We're not drawing back. God does not take pleasure in the, those of us that draw back. No, you've got to keep pressing. You press on to the high mark in Christ Jesus. You run your race. You finish your course. If Jesus finished his course, then you have the ability to finish your course and to run your race. God is not holding your sin against you. Amen. The accuser may. He may go to heaven and say, look what they've done. Look what they've done. Look what they've done. Look what they've done. And God in himself also knows that judgment has to come because of sin. But suddenly he turns to his right and says, what do you say, Jesus? And he turns to his father and says, my blood is sufficient. My blood cured everything. My blood washed everything. My blood restored do you not know you have an advocate in heaven? He's the greatest lawyer of ever. And he's there for you. You can trust in that. You have to understand that we are joint heirs with Christ Jesus. We do reign and rule with him. Whether we exercise that or not, it's based upon knowledge and believing that knowledge. And that knowledge comes from God's word. It's based upon believing God's word. If he said it, that just settles it. Whether people believe it or not, it won't change. It's like a few years ago, I saw a, a, a license plate on the front of a car and says, Jesus is my co-pilot. I'm like, what the heck? You need to move over. Are you kidding me? He needs to be the pilot. Jesus is my co-pilot. Come on, hop in, Jesus. Where do you want to go? I'm not even there. Hey, here's the keys. Let me sit next to you. It's a lot easier that way. We are, to, we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We reign and rule with him. In Ephesians 1, 18 through 23, it says this, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened. Sometimes we can't see what we can't see. But if you ask the Lord, show me. Show me, Lord. Show me where I'm missing it. Show me where I need, I need to change. And Lord, because of that change, I know you'll help me because you're my advocate. You're my standby. You're my strengthener. When I'm weak, you are strong. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm going over. I'm not going under. The gates of hell will not prevail against me. You've never seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. I'm a part of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm an ambassador here on the earth. I represent all heaven because all heaven backs me up. Up. and all heaven backs you up you are not alone you have the angels of heaven you have the word of God you have God almighty you have Jesus Christ and you have the mighty Holy Ghost we reign and rule with him and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to his working of mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but that in the world to come. And hath put all things under his feet and given him the head of everything, even the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. We are seated with him. Even in our imperfection. That's amazing. That is mind-blowing. 
It just blows my mind. And when you know who he really is, when you really know who God really is, you won't, you, you'll, you'll run to him even in your mess. Even if you feel guilty, because remember, you have a free will. You can run to him. He's there for you. He'll never relax his hold on you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Because when Jesus said, it is finished, it is everything you and I and what we need in this life to run a race and finish our course. Can you say amen? amen? Come on, stand to your feet if you would. Thank you for joining us today. To learn more about our international ministry and how to become a partner, visit jackmarsministries.com or lifefamilychurch.net.